it might look through the lens of the kind of the social political arena in the world today, even though God is pretty much left out, right? You see him at work. And I don't know about you, but I love seeing how the word of God is such it's so alive and active, and yet we're seeing things, prophecy being fulfilled before our very eyes. It's exciting to be alive for such a time as this. So um, I wanted to share with you, I, um, I'm not a big news person. Uh, however, I do like to kind of keep my pulse on. And I don't know about you guys, but I have a hard time trusting what all the information and the data that's coming in. And so it gets confusing for me. And so um, I often will go to the Christian Broadcast Network and CBN, I don't know if anybody else um, accesses their resources. So I kind of share what's happening today in the world, and I just think it's so interesting. Uh, so uh, Israel, as you guys know, is experiencing a seven-front war, right, since October 7th. Prime Minister Netanyahu um, states that Israel is experiencing an existential threat. So their very existence is at threat right now. And here we are in Esther. Isn't that very interesting? And I love what he said. This is a quote directly from him. He says, victory is the only option. I sure wish the church would feel that way. And we are the church, so we could stand on that. Victory is the only option. He's in Washington as we speak. He was supposed to meet with leaders that's been postponed because of all the chaos that's happening in the White House. And Americans are very distracted right now. The timing is very interesting. He, he says it's imperative at this visit to ensure that Israel and America stand together today, tomorrow, and always. Those are his quotes. Unfortunately, Kamala Harris is unable to be present when he addresses Congress. She has a scheduling conflict. <laughs> Interesting times we live in. Interesting times. It's just amazing. I love this book, and I had heard Linda lecture about we have to do a little bit of inferring. Does that make sense? Some things, that, I mean, this is a great historical record, and so we have to kind of fill in the blanks a little bit, and even though God isn't mentioned, I see that his ways and the responses of his people are relevant to us today. Would you agree? Yes, it's pretty exciting. Well, let's pray and we'll dig in, okay? Lord, I lift up Israel to you. You never slumber or sleep when it comes to Israel. They are the apple of your eye. And you have a plan, a redemptive plan. Lord, we are excited to be living in this time in history. Because you have a plan and purpose for your church, for your people. And so, Lord, I pray with fervency and desire your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your people, raise up an army of people that are about your kingdom and not of this world. I confess, Lord, it's easy to be stuck in the muck of what we're living in and to be distracted and to care more about the things of this world than the things of your kingdom. And so, Lord, I pray you would help us change our hearts, change our perspective, change our priorities, and may we take risks in your kingdom as you are leading and guiding. In Jesus' name, amen. So I titled this Risky Business because I feel like the, the chapters three and four is a lot of risk is taking, um, occurring between Mordecai and Esther. They're taking huge risks in the culture that they live in. So I had to look up the word risk, and it means to expose someone or something that is valued, that may be harmed, 
lost, or in danger? Do you think God is calling us to risk what we perceive as valuable? That we could risk harm or loss? Did Jesus risk? Did he model risk? Yeah. So it makes me uncomfortable to even say it because I think if I'm being real and honest, there's a lot of things and people that I really value that I would not want to be exposed to harm. And yet we are living in such a time that maybe we need to consider these thoughts. So the key verse, as we know, I'm super excited, for if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. God's plans will not be thwarted. Okay? But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows if perhaps you have come to your royal position for such a time as this, such a, a, a timeless verse, right? So we want to look at what this risky business looks like. And the first thing, as we very well are aware, we have an enemy, right? And it's interesting if we look at the history of Haman, he's an Agagite who is from the family line of the Malachites, who are the sons of Esau. So um, Isaac is the patriarch there. And as you know, Abraham had the promised child Isaac. Isaac had two sons. Esau and Jacob. Israel comes from the line of Jacob. The Amalekites come from the line of Esau. Okay, so that's where Haman comes from. <clears throat> this lineage is an enemy of God and his people. In fact, God declares war. He declares war with the Amalekites from generation to generation. And I gave you some scriptures to look up. Can you imagine your lineage being at war with God? It just makes me tremble. It's like, whoa, that is scary, very scary. As you guys know, David, not David, but Saul was uh, asked, commanded to eliminate this line completely. Women, children, livestock, the whole thing. And at first glance, I don't know about you, but when I see those commands from God, I'm like, oh, that's just so cruel. Why would you, women and children, and it's like a cancer. You gotta get rid of it, all of it. And because Saul was disobedient, the Amalekites were able to continue, and they're still a threat today. It's very interesting how much obedience is so critical. So the enemy of God, and this should sound familiar, is to destroy, kill, and annihilate his people. In John 10, 10, the thief comes, right, to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I came that they may have life and life abundant. It's very opposite right? So I think we can all agree that there is an enemy. And even though he might have the face of Haman, or he might have the face of Hitler, or he might have the face of Hamas, it's the same enemy. Okay. So the next one is anti-Semitism is the evil spirit of Haman, Hitler, and Hamas. This evil spirit is manifested as violence. In fact, the word Hamas means violence. Hatred and destruction. In Genesis 6:11, it says, "Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of Hamas violence." I was listening to a uh, pastor again on CBN, and he said he'd seen some footage from October 7th, and he said the atrocities that he saw was like demons were possessed into these people and just running havoc the spirit of violence. So if you don't believe there's a spiritual realm, please consider there is a spiritual realm. Yeah. There is a worldwide hatred that is intensified with anti-Semitism. And something that I have been pondering and contemplating lately is the spirit of antichrist, the spirit of anti-Messiah, and, and anti-Semitism, and when I've done some research, they're very much connected. Does that make sense? And it's really this hostility, first and foremost, to the Jews. And because we are grafted in, right, 
we're gonna we're, we're like secondary into that but i really feel like this anti-messiah the general focus has been the jews and it has been since the beginning of time so i don't know if that i'm not saying i'm right i'm just saying that's something to consider and contemplate it's very interesting the players are in place so we have iran russia and turkey turkey is um pat was was persia so that gives you some context there but we've never seen in our lifetime or probably in all of history such a global hatred did you guys find it absolutely perplexing i'm going to use that word when even in america there was this hatred and violence and destruction of, of Israel in our own country. It's, it, it's absolutely shocking to me, shocking. Such a time as this. All right, will you guys imagine something with me? So let's imagine that you wake up one morning and your husband is watching Fox News. Does that happen? Anybody live in that world? Some of you do. And all of a sudden, there's an announcer that says on June 23rd, 2025, all the Jews and the Christians worldwide will be terminated. That's the announcement. All of a sudden, your phone starts blowing up. You're getting alerts and text messages and emails, voice messages of the same message. June 23rd, 2025, we are going to kill and annihilate all the Jews and all the Christians of the world. How would you respond? It's open for discussion. How would you respond? Fight. What's that? Fight. Fight. Fight, pray, pray, fight. Okay. What? Hide. Yeah. I mean, let's be real. How would we respond if you got that? I know for me, my stomach would drop. Like I would be like, my heart would just drop to my stomach immediately. That's how, when I hear bad news like that, that's my first physical response. What else? How else would you respond? Tammy. Yeah, gather your peeps. Yeah, gather your peeps. Yeah. And yet we see in Esther, that's what was broadcasted. Can you imagine the impact that would have? And we'll see how they responded here in just a second, which you guys have already read through, but we'll just kind of revisit that. How would you prepare for that? You have 11 months. How would you prepare? Get your will in order. Leave tracks all over your house. <laughs> I mean, those are some of my thoughts. What else? What? Flee? So find a bunker somewhere where you can... Yeah? Well, it's worldwide. It's worldwide. Get your people together. Yeah. Get the body of Christ together. Do what? Be in the middle. It's like the sheep are all out here. We're here in the middle. Krista said, she's going to be very proactive. She's going to email the leaders and question and challenge and ask why. Yeah. Yeah, it would definitely shift your paradigm, wouldn't it? Completely. Yeah. Interesting. Thanks for dialoguing with me on that. So let's see how Esther and Mordecai responded to this news. Response to evil. They were perplexed and confused. So Esther in 315 says the couriers went out, hastened by the king's command, and the decree was proclaimed in Susa, the citadel. So the king and Haman sat down to drink. So they're like, woohoo, this is great. 
but the city of Susa was perplexed. I looked up the word perplexed. It means puzzled or baffled. Do you ever just look at the world today and go, what the heck is going on? It is so nonsensical. That seems like an appropriate way to respond to evil. It's just unconscionable. It's hard to, it's hard to wrap our brains around it, right? So when I start there, then we see um, the people and Mordecai mourning humility and repentance. That was his response to this news. It says, when Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the midst of the city, very public. He cried out with loud and bitter cry. He went as far as the front of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. He made a spectacle of himself in public. When's the last time you made a spectacle of yourself? In public. I can't say that I have. Sackcloth and ashes used, were used as a public sign of repentance and humility before God. It also indicated a deep grief over sin and evil in a natural, national disaster. So that is a way to respond to evil, is mourning, humility, and repentance. And what does Esther do? So when Esther heard this, verse 4, so Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. I don't know about you, but if I got the edict, then in 11 months, it's going to be annihilated, I'd be deeply distressed as well. So that's how she's responding. What's interesting, she doesn't have all the facts yet. I don't know about you, but I find I get most distressed when I don't have all the facts. So that might be a sign. If I'm feeling distressed, maybe I need to find out some more information. Just a thought. So then what happens? She tries to minimize what's happening or try to placate the intensity of the response to evil. So she says, then she sent garments to clothe Mordecai. She wanted to cover this whole thing up and take his sackcloth away from him. Like, stop this. Don't make a spectacle of yourself. But he would not accept them. And I was thinking about how often in the, in the face of evil, I want to cover it up or fix it somehow and I, in human efforts. And I love that you just can't do that. And I see that Esther tried. And again, I'm putting some conjecture into this. Then the next way that Esther responded to evil was in fear. So if I go to verse 10, then Esther spoke to Hatachi, Hatachi, I don't know, and gave him a command for Mordecai. All the king's servant and the people of the king's province know that any man or woman who goes in the inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but one law to put all to death. So she's worried about her own skin. I would be too. She's human, I'm human, you're human, right? But what has God given us? Not a spirit of fear, but what has he given us? Power, love, and a sound mind. We have power. Love overcomes everything. His love overcomes everything. What if you and I, in the face of evil, walked in power and in love and in a sound mind? Do you think that would make an impact in our sphere of influence? when the world is going absolutely nuts, right? How attractive would that be? And then the famous verse that we are looking at too, remain silent, inactive, and comfortable, because she was very comfortable. She had put some security in her palace and in her position. She could just lay low, right? I know for me, we all said we'd like to hide. <laughs> we would find a security bunker in some way. So that's a natural response in the face of evil. Comfort in this world leads to wandering from God. I believe that was Beth Moore. 
The evil reminds us that this is not our home. The more the world is heating up, the more I long for heaven. Anybody else? Yeah, time is running out. And evil serves a purpose to make us so we're not so comfortable. Gives us a little shock. So this is how they responded to evil. Now, how did they prepare? So the next bullet point, God prepares and positions his people for his providential purposes and timing. He chose yours and mine family of origin. He chose the culture that we are living in. He chose our backgrounds, our education, our experiences for such a time as this. What I find with the Lord is he wastes nothing, even the bad, the ugly, the messy, and the broken. He doesn't waste it because he's a redemptive God. He doesn't leave anything undone, and I love that about him so much. Habakkuk 1.5 um, Habakkuk was crying out to God. He said, there's violence all over the world. People aren't obeying the laws. There's destruction everywhere I look. Why, Lord? Why? What's happening? What's happening? And this is how the Lord replied, look around at the nations. And I think we could all say, yeah, we're looking around. Look and be amazed. For I am doing something in your day, in my day. Something you wouldn't believe even if someone told you about it. God is always at work, and we get the privilege to join him in that work. How exciting. Another way we can prepare is when we are discerning evil, and I think we are, can testify that, yeah, we're discerning a lot of evil, prepare by ensuring you're seeing the darkness through light. Jesus says, why are you so concerned about a speck in somebody's own eye when you have a log in your, in your eye? So oftentimes we can lack discernment and not deal with our own evil, our own darkness. So let's be light first before we respond or prepare for evil. Does that make sense? Clearly, what did Esther decree for them to do for three days? Fast. And we know fasting goes with prayer. How many of you know that July has been, there's been a call to the church to fast and pray for the month of July? How many of you knew that? Very few of you. That's what I suspected. Can I share one more little bit of news? I like to see how God's working. The state of Tennessee declared 31 days of prayer and fasting. State Representative Monty Fritz was the author of the measure. He told CBN News in a statement, Tennessee and our nation are facing many grave issues that threaten our liberties, our peace, and our quality of life. We cannot legislate ourselves out of these problems. And I've heard Linda say that so much, you cannot legislate morality. It needs to be supernatural. We cannot spend our way out of solutions a merciful, sovereign move of God to heal our land is the only way these issues can be addressed. Call to the, we are called to those who are physically, or the call is to, those who are physically able and spiritually inclined to do so, to humble themselves, repent of their sin, fast and pray for God's mercy, grace, and blessing on our state and on our nation. Representative Fritz continued, this is not about the government telling the church what to do. It is a call for the church to retake her place of authority in our society, for the people of God to pre repent of our complacency and for the fact that we have largely retreated from the world. We've hidden exactly how we've responded to, lethal, uh, to evil. If my people are called by name, my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and will heal their land. Second Chronicles 714. Some of you really appreciate California Pastor Jack Hibbs. How many of you enjoy him? Yep, I think of you. Yep. This is what he says. He has called upon every pastor in every Christian church in the nation to join Tennessee and intercede for America and all the states. Let's all be like Tennesseans. 
this month of July and pray and fast for the Lord leads, stated Pastor Hibbs. Have you noticed there's been a lot of moving pieces this month? I just wonder what the connection might be. And that's one state that's dedicated. Can you imagine if the whole church fasted and prayed? Can you imagine? Unbelievable, unbelievable for such a time as this. Another way we can prepare, we can prepare our hearts. And how we do that is we just kind of think about our internal responses and our internal reactions because they're very good in indicators. So if I look at evil and I become smug and arrogant and gossipy and superior and complaining and all those kinds of things, I do not have a right heart to face evil and be prepared to face evil. However, if I look at evil and my heart is light, and I, I, I have asked the Holy Spirit to cleanse me as his vessel, I'm going to be filled with grief and love, and I'm going to be driven to prayer. Driven to prayer. I have a confession. I was sharing with Sheree actually recently. My heart aches for this group. Where are the young moms? Where are they? I was a young mom when I started. Many of you were young moms when we started. It really grieves me, you guys. So I found myself complaining. I found myself getting upset. And I felt like the Lord really pressed upon my heart. Turn that grief and drive to prayer. And so I've been praying daily that there would be childcare available here so that you as the older women can invite those young moms into this space. I heard, and this might step on some toes, I heard someone that I really look up to say, you know what, I stopped doing women's ministry because I got tired of feeding fat sheep. Out chomp. The time is short. We got to get young women in the seats. I will continue to pray and rack my brains for somebody who will step up for such a time as this and take care of children. It's not acceptable, you guys. We can't be complacent about that. Okay, moving on. Also to prepare is we need to tr surrender and trust the outcome. I am so motivated to walk in the spirit that I feel like I have entered into this kingdom walk of unknown <laughs> and it's glorious. I have no idea what God's going to do. I just know I need to show up. And it doesn't mean that I don't have to have a plan, but I'm like, I don't need an agenda. I just need to show up. I need to prepare to be his vessel of love. I need to be prepared to be a listening ear and be prepared to share with them what is God has instilled in my heart for the last two decades. I don't want to be a fat sheep. I want to be a lean sheep that gladly shares the banquet with others. So now we get a call to risk for such a time as this. I love this. This is what Mordecai did. He stayed true to our identity in Christ without compromise. We need to know who we are. We need to walk in victory. I'm so tired of believers walking in defeat. That is not the abundant life. We are in a position of victory because our king is victorious. And if we are following our king who's victorious, there's no reason for you and I to walk in defeat. We don't have time to wallow. We've got to enter into our position and our identity. We have authority and power because of him. Mordecai would not bow down to evil and declared his true identity. He said, I'm a Jew 
and he knew that was going to cost him his life. Jesus said, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. That's a risk. When we step out, the world is going to hate us. That scares me. I like to be liked. Am I willing to make that risk? For the sake of the kingdom, there are people perishing right now because they don't know him. The next way we can risk is we need to let go of this evil world and fix our eyes on the king and his kingdom. We are not called to an easy life, but a purposeful life. I think in America, and I'm guilty, is I've lived a life of ease. I like comfort. I need to risk letting that go and moving into a realm that is eternal. This is temporary. It's got awfully quiet. Another way we risk, God invites us to take risks to participate in his redemptive purposes. I just read this, and I know I've shared this before. Bible literacy within the church. Guess what it's down to? 6%. 6%. No wonder there's a great falling away. No wonder there's a great deception. We don't know the truth. 6%. That's not okay. You and I, who have been sitting in this chair, we have something. We can guide somebody to learn the scriptures. There's only one book, only one book that has life and that is spiritual. I was thinking of Philip, Acts 8. He was literally moved by the Holy Spirit, if you know what I mean. <laughs> He has an encounter with an Ethiopian eunuch. And this eunuch is reading from scripture. And Philip asks him, do you understand? And he says, I love this. How can I unless someone guides me? You hold the guide. Each and every one of you. How exciting for such a time as this. Beginning at the scripture, Philip preached. Jesus. You ladies are fully equipped to preach Jesus for such a time as this. How exciting. What risk do you need to take in order to do that? And maybe you're already doing that. That's awesome. But if you are not, I pray the Holy Spirit convicts you to the core. We do not have time to stay fat. We don't. There's such a hunger out there. I can't even begin to tell you how many women that are starving for what you have. But they are lost. They have no one to guide them. I talked to my sister that day. She loves the Jesus. I, can't, I don't understand the Bible, so I don't read it. How many times have you heard that in your life? Finally, call to action. When Linda taught me how to, to, to share the word with you guys, she always says, what is it that you want, that the Lord wants the audience to know? And this is it. What risk is God calling you to? Only you can answer that. I would start with prayer. Talk to your table leaders. The harvest is so full, so full. And I believe it's only going to get fuller as the days get darker. Let's pray. Lord, you've given us everything for life and godliness. You have gifted us with every spiritual blessing. You have positioned us in the heavenlies. You have given us your Holy Spirit. We confess we do not have any more excuses. And so, Lord, I pray that your love and your courage and your strengths and your desires for us 
would grow to be about your business, even though it's a risky business. We can risk because you've already risked it all on our behalf. We have nothing to fear, but fear itself. And so Lord, forgive us for being distracted, for being consumed in defeat, for holding too closely to this world, for being too comfortable. Change us, Lord. We can't do it on our own. We need your spirit. Your word says in the latter days, your spirit will be poured out like never before. We receive that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, ladies.